Okay, last time we uh, came up with this expression for the vertical component of the acceleration due to, to gravity that included all the, the vertical component from all the differential volume elements along the length of the cylinder in and out of the screen. And that gave us the vertical component at some arbitrary point, a single point. Uh, resulting from all those differential, it could be this point, uh, resulting from all the differential volume elements uh, in and out of the screen. And, and in that case, R was equal to M. <clears throat> now we're going to let M equal R, and we're going to let the gravimeter now move along a transect normal to the axis of the cylinder and once again compute the vertical component at each point along the transect. So we'll get uh, g as a function of x over z or just x. <clears throat> and we'll find that it's a symmetrical anomaly like uh, like the sphere. Okay, so we we have this expression as a starting point and uh, we also, you know, gave us a hint, if you were to try this on your own, that no further integrations were really required. So all we need to do is, um, well, if we want to express g as a function of x, then we've got to express r as a function of x, in, in fact, function of x and z. So r is just equal to x squared plus e squared to the one-half power. And um, since we're, we need to get the vertical component along this transect, we also need to get cosine of theta. This term here, z over r, which gives us a z over x squared plus e squared to the one-half power. <clears throat> so we're computing the vertical component, which is g times the cross-sectional area of the cylinder times the density or density contrast divided by r times the cosine of theta, which gives us this additional factor z over r. So vertical component factor cosine of theta or z over r substituting for r, we have r squared we have z over r squared. r is equal to x squared plus e squared to the one-half power. So r squared is just equal to x, x squared plus z squared. So now we're going to pull z squared out of this denominator. So we have a z squared here. We have a z up here. <clears throat> so one of these z's cancels out. And we get 2 pi r squared rho over z times 1 over x squared over z squared plus 1. So this is the form we left you with um, all the video before last, I think. Uh, we've got a term here which defines the maximum uh, acceleration due to gravity over the sphere. And then we have this term here, which is the uh, shape term. So uh, maximum value, shape term. And so obviously we can conduct this the same kind of analysis that we did with the um, with the sphere, and I left you with the question here. You know, at, at what point x over z along the profile would g sub v equal to one half g max? Well, that would be when this term is equal to one half. So if you want to test yourself, take a moment. Uh, and come back to that question if you already haven't done it and figure out what the value of x over z is where g sub v drops to one half g max. Okay, so <clears throat> we're basically just, uh, you know, we have g sub v equal to g max times one over x squared over z squared plus one. Uh, we're interested in this ratio. When does the anomaly fall off to one half of its maximum value? So we set the shape term equal to one half. That gives us g max times one half up here. And then we just solve uh, rearrange terms. Solve for x squared over z squared. We find x squared over z squared is just equal to one. So x one half. This is a 
we're referring to a specific location now. This is the position to the left or to the right where the anomaly falls off to one half of its maximum value. So this is a specific value of x. So we should label it with a subscript x one half, <clears throat> indicating that it's either of these two positions here. So z then is just equal to x one half. That's easy. So we get an anomaly. If we think it's associated with a cylinder, look at the distance from the point of symmetry out to the point where the anomaly drops off to one half its maximum value and on either side or take an average and then that gives you the depth z. So you know following the same procedure we could let the shape term equal three quarters, we could let the shape term equal two thirds, we could come up with all these uh, um, values of x over z uh, we know when we take the reciproc reciprocal of that, we get the depth index multiplier. <clears throat> so you should be able to derive, you know, the depth index multiplier is, so in the case of um, x three quarters, we would multiply that distance by 1.72 in order to get z. Or at two thirds, we'd multiply that by 1.41, you know, that x, three quarters or that x two thirds, x two thirds times 1.41 would give you z. All these estimates of z should be the same. And you should be able to derive uh, additional multipliers, uh, the, these additional multipliers, just kind of following this approach if, you, if you'd like. So let's take a look at a problem. We have, uh, we have an anomaly. We're pretty sure it's associated with a tunnel. Um, could be a subway tunnel, you know, something pretty large. <clears throat> We've got an anomaly of uh, about 4.25 milligals, and we have some noise. So we have noisy data. And we have these different uh, diagnostic positions that we're, we're working with. So we'd probably want to use more than just one diagnostic position. So we'd probably want to use multiple diagnostic positions and take an average in order to get the kind of the average depth. And if we do that, <clears throat> a messy looking diagram, but here's x three quarters, here's x three quarters, 60, 68, this is uh, x one half, 100, x one third, 150 on this side, 145 on this side, x one quarter, 190 on this side, and 170 on this side. So you can see it particularly when the anomalies begin to fall off, they fall off into the background noise. So very often these multipliers that are determined from the lower parts of the anomaly can have more error. But we'll take an average. Uh, we've got 60, 68, 105, 150 or 145, 190 or 170 for the values of uh, X sub N at these different diagnostic positions. Uh, where the anomaly falls off to three quarters, two thirds, one half, one third, one quarter, taking the, you know, multiplying through by the depth index multiplier. 60 times 1.72 gives us 103. 68 times 1.41 gives us 96 and so on. We take the average and we find that the cylinder is located approximately 102 meters or the tunnel is located approximately 102 meters beneath the surface. Okay, so now that we figured out what the depth is, we <clears throat> you know recall that we have these other forms of the expression for G max. We can you know it has the terms R squared, R uh, delta rho. We could solve for delta delta rho. We already know what Z is. We could solve for delta rho if we knew what we had an idea of what R was for the typical subway, whatever. Um, or we could, if we knew what R was, we could estimate what the uh, delta rho was. Is it water filled? Is it air filled? Uh, we also have these constants, which are set up to allow us to use mixed units. 
So we have anomalies in milligals, we have R and Z in meters, and we have delta rho in grams per cubic centimeter. Here we have uh, R and Z in feet, and delta rho in grams per cubic centimeter. We have a different constant. So in feet, we have these two expressions here that we could solve for R and delta rho. So we're going to pose the following problem. We assume that we have a tunnel that's air-filled and the density of the surrounding strata is 2.6 grams per cubic centimeter, so that gives us a delta rho of minus 2.6 grams per cubic centimeter. You take a moment and uh, solve for R. We're working in meters, so we'd be using this expression. And if you do, you'll find that the radius of that uh, tunnel, just substituting in for the various terms, is going to be approximately 20 meters. So hopefully you were able to, to uh, work through that problem and come up with, with R. And hopefully, likewise, you, you kind of understand what we've done here in terms of using the uh, different diagnostic positions where x drops off to 3 quarters, 2 thirds, 1 half, 1 third, 1 quarter. We get the depth index multipliers. We're using averages down here where the differences are quite significant. And we're, um, then once we figure out what z is, it's, it's a, a simple matter to figure out what r is or delta rho, depending on what we feel we know. Okay, well next time we're going to take a look at the vertical cylinder and perhaps an additional uh, object and, and we're going to conduct an analysis of two anomalies to uh, determine their source geometry and distinguish between different uh, uh, anomaly extents. Uh, the cylinder and the sphere and the vertical cylinder and the horizontal cylinder. They, they're all symmetrical anomalies. Uh, can we distinguish uh, one from the other? So, uh, we'll, thanks for joining us and we'll see you next time.